Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Scott Stebbin Podcast. Today, we have a uh, exciting episode that we're going to talk about. We're Today, we're going to talk about what is the best translation of the Bible. I know uh, some of you who are listening, you have your favorites. Um, maybe even you're one of the people who tell people this is the best translation of the Bible, the only translation of the Bible you should be reading. So Mike and I are going to kind of discuss that topic. Um, but before we jump into talking about our topic today, we haven't done Stories Gone Wild in a long time, Micah. I guess that's a wild tap. <laughs> well, I think we just had a lot of good conversation or a lot to talk about that we don't want to like do Stories Gone Wild and then talk and feel like we have to rush. A, we, we It's like we're spending, we don't want to have to rush the main course of, of what we're talking about just so we can uh, really highlight the appetizer, I guess. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. I guess so, but um, I, I really don't think our topic will go too long because um, we're not really going to dive into the nuances and the historical thing on biblical translations. So, um, well, I might mention that briefly just to kind of do like the Cliff Notes version of it. But um, yeah, so story's gone wild. It has been a while. So uh, what do you got for us, Micah? Well, it's funny you should say that. Um... I had a really good one, like probably the week last time we we did it, or uh -huh. the last time that we. I guess I should say like the the last episode where we were going to do it and we didn't do it. So, um, in the in the season of elections um, that we're in, the I saw a friend of mine from high school on Facebook post something about their their grandparents and their grandparents uh have gone to the church at this particular church for years and um the uh i guess as the story goes i had like a long facebook post and a screenshot of the story like uh to read it but i don't think i have it anymore but anyway the long story short like it um i guess this person's grandfather wore like a trump shirt or a trump hat to church and they were asked to leave the church. Oh, wow. Because they had a Trump t-shirt on or a Trump hat or something representing uh, former President Trump. And um, I was just floored because, you know, whether you like him or not, he is he was a president and he's running for president. But, like, even if you, you know, we've had this conversation in other areas of the ministry, like, I, I don't understand how people can just dismiss people because of their political preferences. So I just thought that, that was crazy. Oh yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. And I think that's the takeaway too. We've, we've gotten to a point where we've been so, um, so polarized with politics and, and work and life and family relationships and even within churches that the fact that somebody can walk in wearing like a a Trump shirt or a Kamala t-shirt or, or Joe Biden or whoever or Joe Biden or or um, like the thing I keep seeing like it, it's scaring it's scaring the crap out of my son because we'll watch stuff on YouTube and every time it's either a smear ad against um uh, who is it, Bernie um, Marino. Marino, Bernie Marino, or or Sherrod Brown? And it's like, and I like, Peter's scared. Like some of those ads are pretty terrifying, and some of them are pretty comical as well. Like I, there's one that I laugh at all the time because I'm like, there's no way this is real, and sure enough, we find out that a lot of the stock footage that these people are using actually isn't happening in Ohio. It happened in California. <laughs> So it has nothing to do with Sherrod Brown at all. So it's like the funniest thing in the world. But anyway, I digress. Um, but yeah, like that, I think that's kind of hard to do. Like I know when I was at camp ministry, we had a guy who was leading worship because we had a band come in and he was wearing a Budweiser t-shirt. And I can remember uh, my boss went up to him and said, hey, you need to turn your shirt inside out because we don't want to like, 
it seems like you're promoting beer to a bunch of kids. And the guy was like, oh, 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 I'm sorry. So he did. He like had, he like went behind the stage. He flipped his shirt around. He turned it inside out. So it was blank. I mean, he didn't like kick out the guitarist of the band saying, hey, you're wearing a Budweiser shirt. Get the heck out of here. You're no longer welcome here. Like, he was just like, hey, can you do that? Here's what we think. And, and you know, he was nice about it. He wasn't mean about it. It's like, oh, okay. And the guy did it. It'd be like, hey, I mean, even like in churches, like I know some churches, they are like, well, you can't wear a hat when you're in a sanctuary. So even if you walk in with a, you know, make America great again hat or or Trump 2024, you know, hey, can you please take off your hat? We're in the sanctuary. We want to show respect to God and, and take that off. And, you know, that's fine. But I think that's kind of, um, yeah, but to kick someone out of a church because of what they're wearing, I mean, that's that. I think that's a little too far for me personally. Yeah, it's, it could be. It's, yeah, I have a lot that I could say about that, but I just don't understand people's motives other than you can't, like, that's not being Jesus, you know, loving your neighbor. Like, I mean, I'm sure you have neighbors who have different political opinions than you and whatever, but like, just it's, it's, yeah. It's just gotten yeah. to the point now where it's ridiculous. Well, and I think it's funny too, cause you know, uh, this past Sunday we had a marketing team come into our church and we're kind of like figuring out, you know, you know, kind of figuring out a vision, core values of the church and, you know, and kind of, you know, how do we let the community know about our church and what we stand for, what we believe and what we offer to our community? That's kind of the goal of this. And it's actually funny because when you look at um, and and the guy who did the marketing, he he interviewed people in the church, like church members. He interviewed some of the groups that we have. We have like a Gamblers Anonymous and an Alcoholic Anonymous. Um, and we had the Scouts and everyone else that comes to this church. We kind of have them here. And then on top of that, we also sent something out to like some of the community chat rooms or the community like Facebook pages and just say, hey, what do you guys think about this church that's in your neighborhood? And just get stuff from there. And it was funny because we we were all over the map, which was great. But one of the things, one of the terms that was used for uh, the church was liberal. But then you also had a term that said that we were also homophobic an anti-LGBTQ community. I'm thinking, well, how can you be liberal and also be anti? I mean, I guess you could. I guess that that is a possibility. But it's stuff like that where you go, usually those two things are kind of go together. And it's funny that people are, the community perception was that you're very liberal because you're UMC, but also you don't like gay people too. And I think that was kind of weird, like, huh? Like that's odd, but anyway, um, yeah, but yeah, it's 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 one of those things that we've gotten to this point, and I don't know if it's ever going to change. I hope it does because I know for pastors, it's just hard trying to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ when you are in a very difficult political season, and not necessarily the difficult because you have a Republican and a Democrat going against each other. But the fact that most of the um, campaign has been, I'm, oh, this, if you like this person, they're going to do this and they're going to do. So it's a lot of fear mongering and a lot of like bashing and not really talking about, it's almost like don't, it's almost like instead of saying vote for me because here's the things, here's the things I'm going to implement. Here's my plan. Here's my proposal. Here's the things that I want to do to really help America move forward. Where a lot of it is don't for this, the, the, don't vote for this person. You should vote for me because if you vote for this person, here's all the bad stuff that's going to happen. And I'm like, well, cool. You're telling me not to vote for someone, but you're still not telling me why I need to vote for you mm -hmm. and why you matter. And that's, and I think that's kind of the the difficult part. Well, I felt like the uh, vice presidential debates, you know, however you view them, I felt almost that was a little bit more. It was very cordial. civil. It was very civil, very cordial. And it was, and a lot of times, even though there was like a little bit of jabbing here, like, oh, Kamala or oh, Trump, it was more of, um, 
you know, there's a couple times where the vice president candidates would say, well, you know, I kind of agree with, I agree with my opponent. We just have a different way of trying to solve this problem or trying to, trying to do it. You know, he has a different methodology than I do. And so basically it's like, you're basically voting. Who do you think's, whose methodology do you think is going to align with your values and your beliefs? And I think that's a little bit more of kind of the debates that I was used to uh, prior to, you know, 2016. Um, but, you know, that's just the way it is. Um, for my story, has gone wild. Um, yeah, it's kind of hard because there's been so much going on for so long. But, I mean, I know I told you this be before we recorded, but, like, this morning, I was worried about my daughter. Like, my daughter has been getting nosebleeds a little bit. But, you know, it's like, okay, she sneezes, and you can just see, like, you know, it's a dry, you sneeze real hard. Like, actually, I, I sneezed real hard one time, and I got a bloody nose. It's like, wow, I never get bloody noses, so it must be really dry. And um, I woke up this morning, I'm trying to get her up, and she rolls over, and all I see on her pillows is this big pool of blood on her pillow. And I'm like, uh-oh. So I'm like... Laura, can you please come up here, please? So we're looking at her. I'm trying to check her out. Make it, I mean, and that's the thing. She rolls over, but she's rolling over where her face is still in the pillow. Like, I can't see her face. So I don't know if she's bleeding from her nose. Is she bleeding from an ear? Like, where is she bleeding from? And then, of course, my son, who, and this is where this, I'm going to say the story's fun. Uh, two weeks ago, my the fifth graders had a, um, a talk about your changing bodies. So it's kind of talking a little bit about, hey, you're going to notice some changes with your bodies. Ladies, you're going to notice. And the thing is, is they opted to just do everybody together instead of having the guys and the girls separate. They had guys and girls talk. So they're talking about, here's all the changes that's happening with you, boys. You're going to get something called an erection. You're going to have hair on your private. It's like your voice is going to get deeper. And then girls, you're going to bleed out your vagina. <laughs> like, yeah. So, so Peter, Peter so Peter automatically thought. Peter thought that his sister, who's six years old, was on her period. <laughs> I'm like, it, no, it's a by her pillow. Mm -hmm. She probably has a nosebleed, buddy. Get out. And I'm like, dude, get out of here. Get out. And I told him to get out of here, not because I was mad at him. I just didn't want to start busting up laughing in front of him. I'm like, Peter, it's not that. Just, just get out of here. And at that time, I'm just like sitting there laughing. I'm like, why don't you tell your mother what you just said? I'm sure she would have loved that. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Like, there's been a couple of times where Peter was asking questions to Laura about what he was learning, and then he makes an offhanded compliment. And there's one time he said something that was absolutely hilarious, and I couldn't laugh. Because Laura was ticked at him. And I'm like, oh my gosh, but it was so funny. And I can't laugh at it because I know I'm going to get in trouble too. I'm going to be encouraging him to say more. <laughs> Stop. So that's, that's the challenges you have as, parent, as a parent, Mike. You get to look forward to the things when your daughter, when she starts talking, she's going to say stuff either to you or she's going to say something to um, your wife. And then one of you is probably going to think it's absolutely hilarious and you don't want to laugh because you know, it's going to, if you start laughing, then it's just going to make things a lot worse. <laughs> well, one of the things I like, I think it's fascinating is that like, I, you know, of the people in my close circle, you and Jordan and others, like we all have children and they're all different ages. And so like, it's, it's fun to see where we all are and the things I have to look forward to. And I think, you know, of something, you know, you just mentioned, you know, I'm like, well, one day I'm have, we're going to have to have that conversation with my kid. And, yeah, um, you know, I think of Jordan and, you know, he's got a four-year-old that's crazy or I don't even know what the word he uses for it is. Um, mm. But it's kind of cool to see our kids in different ages and, you know. Oh, yeah to see what we have to look forward to as parents and how much stuff has changed since we were their age. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. 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 So um, going to our main topic today, we're going to talk about what is the best Bible translation. So um, the kind of start us off, Micah, if you're reading the Bible, what translation do you 
commonly read? Um, um, it's, it, I think it really just depends. I don't know. So like I went to seminary and when we were writing papers, exegetical or otherwise, um, the Bible that we read in seminary was the NRSV or the New Revised Standard Version. Um, mm -hmm. And that was kind of just the the standard bearer to use for writing at the School of Theology in Anderson. Um, the, I, I enjoy all different types of translations. Um, and if you looked at my bookshelf, I probably have 20 different Bibles. Um, yeah. But I enjoy reading the ESV. Mm. I think it's probably the most easy, easiest version to, to, to read through that or the New Living Translation. Mm -hmm. um, ESV is just really well written. Um, and I would say the same thing for the New Living Translation. Um, NRSV is a little bit, to me, closer to like a, a New King James version. Um, it's like a little too literal for me. Um, also like the message too, like certain passages of the message, um, even though it's, it's not everybody's favorite cup of tea. Like there are certain passages where I'm like, Oh, this, this is, this is a different way to, to write this, but it's actually, um, very well. There's a sense of realism to it. And what I mean by that is that like we, we, we end up, we, we take things too literally sometimes, but if somebody doesn't explain things a certain way, maybe they're going to understand a different way by explaining or reading it differently. And so with the message, I think like there's a lot of um, passages, like, especially in the gospel where, you know, Jesus is doing ministry and it's like, wow, Jesus is talking to me like I'm a person. And so like, I, I really like to, to read the message. Um, but I also like the NKJV. I like the, um, I think a lot of people um, like in, like the NKJV because the NKJV is or New, King, New King James translation um, because it's not as, uh, you know, 16th century, you know, Great Britain, mm -hmm. English, you know, very and I'm not sure like reading another language at times but with the New King James like they they took some of that original text and made it a little bit better in um, phrasing and a little bit better in wording for the folks that you know really don't prefer the King James uh, version so yeah um, but if I'm reading you know, if I pick up my Bible, I always carry, or yeah, I always carry an ESV with me. Mm. And uh, I have a New Living Translation on my desk at work and a New Living Translation um, study Bible that I have at home. Another one I like is the NIV, New International Version. Mm -hmm. And a long time, I think for the in the 90s, that was a very popular yeah. translation for a lot of pastors to go to. And if people were, you know, in youth ministry specifically, like they're, you know, leading kids to the Lord, that would be the first Bible that they would, would give kids. Um, I think it went from NIV to NLT, like the early 2000s to present. People prefer the NLT over the NIV, but um, I feel like I'm rambling on and on about all these translations. And you, <laughs> and you talked about us not nerding out, but like I, you know, <clears throat> I didn't hate the NRSV when I was writing for seminary, but like, you know, wasn't my favorite version, but you know, neither is the King James. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and there's also like uh, CET that I've been reading a little bit recently, the contemporary English translation. Um, mm -hmm. it's cool. Like, uh, what about you? I mean, like, do you have a there? Is there like a favorite version that you like to read? Do you for for studying and writing sermons? Does does Ash? Yeah. Does Does your seminary prefer a certain? version when you're writing papers so when in seminary we were told that there are two translations that we needed to use for seminary either the nrsv or the nasb oh i forgot about the name nasb we always used to call it nasb, NASB. <laughs> um 
And I think a lot of times the reason why is because it's a word by word translation. How they translate the Bible, they do it by word by word versus where the NIV, when they translate it, they try to look at a passage and they try to, you know, they try to interpret it. They try to interpret it from a way of, or translate it from a way of trying to do it phrase by phrase. So for, you know, for the sake of like when you're doing Hebrew or you're doing Greek and you're, and you're going through those biblical languages, it's kind of important for a student because you're not trying to learn, you know, at first you're trying to learn these new Greek words or these Hebrew words, you're learning them individually before you start piecing them together. So sometimes when you're reading the Bible, you're seeing where these words appear in the Bible, you have to kind of go like, okay, I have to understand what this word is and maybe some of these other words, and then I can kind of piece them together and then I can kind of interpret it, interpret the phrase on, you know, does that align to the Bible that I have or does it align to something different, um, to a different translation that may be available? Um, so, uh, but yeah, but I think growing up, like, I mean, I remember the Bibles within the pews at the church I grew up in were um, like the New King James Version of the Bible. Uh, when I got my teen Bible, it was a NIV. I think one time I got a gift from a youth pastor where it was a NLT, but it was like in this like metal like case. So that was the one I always took with me to like camp because I figured, well, it's a you're not going to confuse it with any other Bible because right now I'm the only one who has like a big gigantic metal case over my Bible. So um, might as well do that. And then um, over time, I actually went and got into a kick where I was buying different translations of the Bible or like if I'm walking around campus and I see like some professors are giving away free books outside the Bible and religion program or even seminary. It's like, oh, here's a translation I don't have. So, I mean, I have like a TNIV. I have a NLT, I have a BLT, you know, <laughs> just, <laughs> that was a joke, but um, there's no BLT translation of the Bible. So <laughs> that's just a sandwich. But um, yeah, I think over that, that was, um, you know, so I don't really have like a necessarily favorite one. Like even now doing my doctorate work, I'm using uh, the NRSV because that's just kind of what's expected, you know, Um do, what, do you, what do you use when you're studying to like teach a sermon or preach a sermon? So I, I primarily, I still use the NRSV. I think just because of habit, a lot of times, if I'm not using the NRSV, I'll use the N, uh, the uh, NIV because um, a lot of times it's usually, well, what's the Bible in the pew? Cause if someone forgot their Bible and they're following along with me, they're going to grab that. So if I'm, going to be making an interpretation if I'm studying the Bible or if I'm going to have words on the screen, I want it to match what's in the pew as well. And even though it's projector screens, you can kind of change your translation. And there's been a couple of sermons where I've broken down, especially if I'm like tackling like maybe some, maybe a difficult topic. And I might want to say, well, hey, here's what the KJV says, here's what the NKJV says, here's what the NIV says. It kind of break it down on why is there a variance in some of the texts that we're seeing. Or like, you know, sometimes I once had a lady who shared something with me on Facebook. She goes, hey, this lady's saying that the KJV is the best Bible because it has all the verses where if you look at the NIV, there's some verses that are missing. Like you'll see, I'll do a jump from like 10 to 12. And you won't see a verse 11. It's like, well, why is that? And I'll say, well, here's here's the reason why that is. And I'll kind of talk to him about that. Um, so, I mean, yeah. So I think, you know, if I'm going to be, so usually I'm still going to stay with the NRSV or I'll jump over to an NIV. But like, you know, if I'm at a church where, you know, maybe they have the CEV translation of the Bible in their pews, then I'm probably going to start looking at the CEV. I don't know if it still exists or not, but like in per presenter, you used to be able to run parallel Bibles, mm. meaning that like on the screens, you could like if you were preaching and teaching out of like the NIV, but wanted to show whatever the NKJV was showing, you could run them side by side on your screens, which I thought was really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so kind of like, you know, so kind of what we've talked about, we're, you know, we're sharing about the different Bibles we own, the different Bibles we've read. But the one thing we but you and I have not said was, well, do we think one of them is like 
the best Bible or the superior Bible. I mean, are you someone, Micah, who when you go somewhere, you tell people you need to be reading this Bible because this is the, this is the best Bible translation that you will ever read and all the other ones, they're, they're of the devil. You shouldn't even read those. Like, have you ever said that, Micah? No, but I've had it been told to me. Oh, oh, yeah. Not, I have not been... like, not like in those specific terms, but I've, I've yeah. had folks tell me, you know, this is a KJV only church, and we only teach out of the KJV, and we only read out of the KJV, and um, you know, all those good things. So, yeah. So I, I have a funny story, and I, I may have shared this on the podcast. I may have not. I don't remember. But I remember one of the first churches I was um, interim, doing a long-term interim at. Um, you know, we're sitting there, we're talking, I'm reading the Bible. And of course, the Bibles in the pew are KJV. Most of this old, it was an older congregation. So a lot of them read the KJV. And I remember I was talking to a guy because I think one time I was preaching, I was using the NIV because I liked just how it phrased certain things about the store and it kind of fit with the message. Now, I remember a guy came up to me and he was just, and I mean, he wasn't mean. He was just asking me like, oh, why do you, why, why do you read the NIV? And I just said, well, you know, it's just kind of what I grew up with. It was the pews in the Bible were, you know, the, at least in youth group, the Bibles we had at youth group were NIV. Uh, the first Bible I ever got was an NIV. So it's just kind of been like that. And he's like, oh, and he, and he understood that he respected that. And he said, yeah, you know, my, my great, great grandfather had a KJV. My dad had a KJV. I read the KJV, and we just, you know, that's just kind of why we think the KJV is, you know, the best because, you know, it's kind of been, you know, kind of almost like handed down from generations of the KJV Bible. Well, they had a they had a pastoral prospect do a candidating weekend, and I'm like, okay, so you know, and he was a nice guy, and we're sitting there, and I'm sitting there, and I know the history of this church. I know these people well enough. I remember he was preaching and he was talking about something and somehow he got on the topic of biblical translations and he talked about, I know a lot of people write the KJV, but it's also the most inaccurate Bible. And I'm thinking, oh shoot, this guy just, this, this guy's not going to get hired now. <laughs> he just offended the whole congregation. You talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls. No, he did not. I mean, he he talked a little bit, so it was it was all right. Like you know, I guess no one really cared, but um, you no were really sitting there like, oh, it's about I'm to like, go oh, it's about to go down. It's going down. He's yelling timber. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was all fine, and and they actually ended up voting him in as their pastor, and he was pretty much the pastor there the whole entire time before they closed their doors. Um. Which, you know, surprisingly, like when I was helping them and I was looking at their budget, I'm thinking, oh, this church isn't going to be open for another year. And he was the pastor at that church for almost five to six years before they closed their door. So it was um, so he did a really good job um, with that church, with that congregation to the very end. Um, so, um, yeah, but, you know, I think when it comes to what's the best translation, that's a very hard topic, uh, because even if you look at more on a scholarly side of biblical translations, that's even a hard question to answer, because when you think about something like the KJV or the NIV, they're pulling from two different manuscripts when it comes to um, translations. Like, I believe the KJV is pulling from the... Um, I think it's called the Textus Receptus, which was kind of produced by Erasmus. Um, and then, you know, a lot of like the NIV, it's using poem from like the Novium, like the Novium Testament Greek, or it's a more like critical edition where it's kind of breaking down um, not only your Greek manuscripts, but it's also looking at certain passages from a Greek an Aramaic and a Hebrew. So scholars, when they're interpreting the Bible, they're kind of looking at these different fragments and they're trying to do the best that they can do to do a translation. And kind of one of the things that, so like, you know, the question that the lady sh told me about why is it that the NIV takes out verses? Well, because the source that the NIV is using, it's not there. Like, it's just not there because, again, you're using parchment, you're using copies of copies of copies, 
And a lot of times there is no verse 11 where in the Texas Receptus, there is a verse 11. So that's why they have that in there. Um, other times, you know, other times, the other thing we know about translation is sometimes certain translators have a different methodology of translations. Like I said before, NRSV is a word by word translation where the NIV is a paraphrase. So when the Apostle Paul is talking about the dangers of the flesh and in NRSV, when you're going to see that word, that Greek word that means flesh, you're going to see the word flesh. If you look at the NIV, they're going to translate that word flesh to sinful nature. So they're kind of doing an interpretation for the reader automatically with what Paul's meaning by the word flesh. Um, and then also, like, I think um, I think the difference between those two sources that people are kind of interpreting from, uh, if I think it's in Mark, it's in Mark where Jesus is healing a leper and the leper is asking Jesus to heal him. And in the KJV, in the KJV, it says uh, Jesus was moved with compassion. And he says, if I am here to heal you or something where in the NIV, it says Jesus was indignant. So did Jesus have compassion for the man or was Jesus angry with the leper to asking him to heal like those are and it's not like a there's a greek word that it can mean compassion or angry like they're two different words from two different sources of what's considered the bible that's causing some of those variances within the text so you know a lot of times so to say all that just to say that to talk about what the best translation of the Bible is a very hard code to crack. Because if you say it's the KJV, well, yeah, but a majority of your modern audience isn't going to read the KJV because they don't know, they don't have a doctorate in Shakespearean languages. You know what I mean? Or 16th century, you know, English literature or whatever. Oh, yeah. And if you and like it's clear as day though, if like like for example, if you put the ESV right next to the KJV and we're trying to read them parallel, you would see a significant difference in just text and 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 verbiage and you know all those things. Um, what are your thoughts on the message version? Have you had any like? So, I remember when the message came out and people were like, there was like this big uproar. Where people were like, this is just slander and this is just not this is not right and. Same thing well, about those people that were like, this is the KJV only church. And it's like, really? I mean, here's the, here's the thing about, I'll, I'll, I'll share a story about the message. So I, the only time I can read through the, the book of numbers is through the message. <laughs> the book of numbers. <laughs> well, and here's why. And here's why, because in yeah. numbers, because numbers is basically a census. census. Yeah. So it's just like, Hezekiah, son of blue, blue, blue. He had this many sons. Boom, 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 boom. It is so boring. Yes. But when I read it through the message, the way Eugene Peterson wrote that section of the message, it was almost like a tale. This was Hezekiah, and he and he gave and he had 12 sons, and their names were this one and he was the oldest and then there was this one and he was the second he had seven kids and here are their names and and then and the thing is is in the book of numbers even though it's a census there's certain sections in numbers where they have these little interesting stories like these paragraph stories about that family or about someone in that family and they're like the most beautiful like powerful stories of how God was moving through that family. And yet I think a majority of people don't even know about those stories because they've never read the book of numbers because they open up, they see the census and they're thinking, this is boring. I'm not going to read that. Um, at the same time, when I was in camp ministry, there was a young woman who always came to camp as a camper. I think she went off and was in the Marines for a little bit or tried to get in the Marines. And I don't know what happened. But then eventually she came back to camp and she kind of had like a new, like renew, uh, uh, like a rejuvenation of her walk with lo the Lord. And I remember we we're having like staff devotions and um, we're sitting there and she's doing devotions and she's reading through the message. And she talked about how much she loves the message, 
how it really was easy for her to understand the Bible and really kind of, you know, it was it was for it was it was a way that what was happening in the Bible was very easy for her to connect with God and with Jesus through the message. And one of my other buddies who was also a seminary student goes, yeah, the message is not that good. Like, like the NRSV is the most accurate translation of the Bible. And I'm looking at him like, you, you dummy, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> like, yeah, I, I may know that too. You may know that, but we're not going to say that to the person who's basically, who's kind of like getting back into her faith. She's kind of has a newfound faith in Jesus. And she's saying the message was the thing that helped her do that. And you're going, like, I <laughs> mean, so what she did is she took his big, gigantic, like NRSV hard, hard, cover book that also had the apocrypha in it took some um took some construction paper and made a book cover for it and then on it wrote the message the best bible ever and then that was his bible for the rest of the summer camp but you know for me i love the message because i mean there's certain things like when you read the message there's certain things i'm like yeah, you have to know this isn't a translation. It's a paraphrase. Um, but I think there's certain things that Eugene Peter does, does that kind of really helps people who may not have a good reading, may not be a strong reader, or may necessarily not understand, or maybe the Bible may be intimidating. So the message is kind of like that that portal to help them start reading about God and about Jesus. And hopefully that can kind of help them to actually read like an NIV or an NLT and eventually, you know, maybe an NRSV. Um, and plus the crazy thing is, is when um, the triple X church was starting up, which if you're unfamiliar with the triple X church, it's a, it's an organization that goes to like these uh, sex shows and they, they minister to like porn stars and strippers and prostitutes and, and do some stuff with sex trafficking. And then they even go into churches and kind of help people understand the dangers of pornography and how to have strong, healthier, happy marriages. And, um, you know, when they were doing their Bible, they wanted to have a Bible and they want to put a Bible cover that says Jesus loves porn stars. And that was kind of their thing. And every single Bible, um, publisher said no to them no we're not going to put jesus loves porn stars on the cover of a niv or an nlt or anything else but eugene peterson was the only person that said yes yes we will we will do that and the fact that eugene peterson said yes you can use the message and put your jesus loves porn stars cover on it and you can hand them out to free to when you go to all these like sex expos and everything else and yet there's so many people who are in the porn industry that are now devout followers of Christ because of that ministry. And I, largely, I think a lot of that ministry is successful because they were able to hand them a Bible, even though it wasn't a translation, it was a paraphrase of the Bible. But because Eugene Peterson said, yeah, let's do this, um, I think a lot of those people were able to read the Bible and really connect with God and Jesus in a powerful way that they had a transformation in their life. Yeah. And I think I totally agree. And I think that you can, it just proves that regardless of the translation translation that, you know, people can still receive the gospel as a result. Yeah. And that's, so, and that's, and that's what I don't understand why people get so, you know, been out of shape over translations or having different translations uh, or specific translations, excuse me, uh, being teached and, you know, taught in their church, you know, in their Sunday school classes, small groups, et cetera. But it's like, you know, the older I've gotten and the more small groups that I attend, like I see, you know, let's, let's just use, for example, like I'm going to go to a small group and I have 15 people in my small group. They all might come in with 15 different versions of the Bible. Like, yeah. and that's okay. Right. And yeah, so, yeah. and people, it doesn't really matter. I, I'm thankful that it's gotten to a point in most circumstances and circles that I've been in over the years as I've grown older, that it's not as big of a deal. Um, 
as it once was, which means we're growing as, as Christ followers. Yeah. And, and, and we also have to remember that, um, we also have to remember that, you know, if we want to talk about the best translation, it really has to, the best translation is basically up to the person who's reading the Bible. Cause if they have a translation that they feel that they can connect with, that they feel like when they read it, they really can understand God and Jesus and the theological themes in the Bible, then that's going to be the best version for you. Um, I have a professor who's actually on a committee where they they're working on a Bible called like the, um, I forget what it's called. It's like the first, I think it's called like the first people's Bible. I'm not sure, but basically they're trying to translate the Bible in a way that can be given to your native Americans that still live here. So he's on that. So he was actually giving us samples of that Bible, the things they've been working on and how they're translating it so that the, um, Native Americans can actually understand and know about the Bible and about who God and Jesus is. And I think that's pretty interesting. Now, I mean, when you're reading it, I mean, if someone who's like a KJV only person was to read it, they probably would read this Bible and go, oh, this is wrong. No, 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 no. Um, but to the person, to the Native American who's reading this Bible, they're probably going to think, man, this Bible's great because now I can understand the Bible a little bit better than, you know, what the, um, you know, than you know, the, whatever translation they have within their communes or their camps or whatnot. So, yeah, I think for, so for my opinion, the best Bible translation is the one that you actually connect with the one that you're reading consistently and the one that helps you really understand God. And for you, if that's the NRSV, fantastic. Um, if it, for you, if it's the um, NLT, great if it's the cev that's wonderful if it's the message that's fantastic because at least you're getting into the bible and you're reading it so for me i wouldn't say that there is one translation that's more superior than the other because at the end i mean i think you can ask that question when it comes to a scholarly level like if i'm doing writing papers or i'm being a scholar and i'm writing like journal articles there's probably a translation that i'm going to be using because i want to make sure i'm showing the scholarly depth of my work and and my um hypothesis and everything that i'm using um but if you're just reading the bible just because you want to read the bible because you go to bible study uh when you're at church um really Whatever you gravitate to, the one that you feel like you can connect with and understand and read without having to go, well, what what's this word? This word, I don't understand what this word is. Like that's that's probably the Bible that's going to be best for you. So for like my friend, if it hers was the message, then for her, the message is going to be the best translation of the or best version of the Bible. Uh for my other buddy who says that the NRSV is the best version of the world, the NRSV is going to be his. And that's okay. They're both they're both correct. What about the SSV? What's the SSV? The Scott Stedman version. Uh there is no Scott Stedman version. If anything, it'll be the SSP, the Scott Stedman paraphrase. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, so yep. But yeah, um, yeah. So I think so. I mean, I guess to answer the question, is there a better translation of the Bible out there? Um, to be quite honest, I don't think so. I mean, it really is up to the user, and that's just my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if you find one that's easier to understand and that you understand the gospel, I think that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, friends, and that's going to do it for us. So let us know. Are you somebody who's been told that there is one superior translation than another and it made you feel like pretty sad? Um, are you someone who has a favorite translation of the Bible and want to tell us why? We would love to hear it. Again, you can go to our website, thescottstemon.com, and send us a email 
and we will get back to you. Or you can make a comment on any of our social media channels. Just leave a comment on what your Bible translation is or share your story about someone saying that this translation was the best translation and kind of what came from it. But friends, thank you so much for listening. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and we'll be back on with another episode. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Scott Simmons Podcast. The Scott Simmons Podcast is made possible by support from our listeners. We thank listeners like Patty and Scott, whose support goes to this podcast's continual growth and maintenance. If you want to support this podcast, you can do so in a number of ways. First, feel free to give us a five-star rating if you enjoyed this episode and share it with your friends. If you'd like to financially support the Scott Seven Podcast, you can go to the website ko-fi.com slash the Scott Seven Podcast. That website again is ko-fi.com slash the Scott Seven Podcast. Thank you so much for listening.